start recording. And today, we're going to keep studying the properties of proteins. Um, in the last lecture, we talked about you know, basically amino acids, their properties, um, the, um, their side chains, you know, their characteristics, basically individual, individuality that, um, is, uh, that arises from the, um, the, uh, side, their side chains or groups. Today, um, we we'll still consider those you know, interesting properties of different amino acids, but we'll think about it in a little larger scale not just the, um, the amino acids, but the actual polymer, the protein, and the, um, their sort of uh, higher level structures. So I just want to quickly start with the, um, the uh, pick up the, um, the last part that I um, couldn't explain in the, um, the last lecture, which is the non-protein amino acids. So these are still the, um, the amino acids that are often used in the, um, the living organisms, but not used for the, um, the pro uh, proton, um, protein synthesis. So they are not uh, proteogenic um, amino acids, but they are still have a really critical roles. Like the um, um, neurotransmitters are the examples of that, where they are used for the, um, basically firing the, um, the axons or the, um, some kind of regulations between you know, um, neuromuscular junctions and so on. And the examples of the, um, the amino acids that are used as the neurotransmitters are glycine and glutamate. So they are just a, you know, amino acids as they are, but they can still be used for that, like you know, uh, synapse firing and so on. And also another example is in gamma amino butyric acid, I'm sorry, which is GABA. So, um, if you are familiar with the, um, the neuron or um, uh, nervous system, then you probably have heard a lot of this GABA molecule um, where the, um, the, some of the subgroup of the neurons are fired by the GABA. So they are GABAergic neurons. And other examples are histamines, dopamines, um, thyroxines or um, the thyroid hormones, um, but a bunch of them are there and they're pretty much arrived, um, arise from the, um, the simple amino acid or the, um, some simpler molecules. So for example, this um, trypsin, which is one of the like quite bulky amino acids, um, can be used as a precursor for the, um, many different kinds of the neurotransmitter um, molecules like a serotonin, which I don't have structure here, but I mean, it's pretty simpler to trypsin. And other examples are dopamine here, as you can see. And when you look at the, um, the its structure, it's looking pretty similar to the, um, the um, tyrosine that we've seen, which has a one phenyl ring with the hydroxyl group. Um, there should be a structure here too, right here. So, and that resembles the structure uh, of the phenylalanine too, right? So phenylalanine basically can be, um, uh, changes to the, um, the tyrosine and then going through the, um, the multiple series of sort of um, modifications on the, um, the different functional groups to become a dopamine and further goes out to the, um, the other trans, um, neurotransmitters too. And this uh, thyroid hormone is particularly interesting because this is basically, as you can see, the uh, fuse of two um, tyrosine molecules and that still keeps the, um, this alpha amino acid structure where the, um, this carbon in the center, the alpha carbon has the, um, the both amino group and the, um, the carboxyl group, as opposed to many of the other um, non-protein amino acids actually is a derivative where, the, where there are not no longer alpha amino acids. Okay, so today in this lecture, Again, like I told you, we're gonna talk about the, um, some higher level structures of the, um, the amino acids or their polymers. Um, basically, their amino acid sequences, which is the simplest sort of order of the amino acid in the polymer, right? That determines the, um, the overall 3D structure. And of course, thermodynamics and some other regulations, like you know, some proteins involving in forming the protein shape are there too, like chaperones or some other um, uh, basically heat shock or the heat responsive proteins. But anyway, um, there's a 3D structures that um, um, arise from the, um, the amino acids and they 
um, because of they have a particular 3D structure that confers the, um, the some specialized like uh, specific function of that protein. It could be local protein or the largely the uh, a whole like a protein um, activity too. So um, especially for the protein studies interacting with the other proteins, the interface has to be specialized for those specific interactions, right? So in that case, the 3D structure on that interface is really important. And that also is coming from the, um, this sequence where it gives the, um, the, all the um, different arrangement of an amino acids for the, um, the making the hydrogen bonding or some other interactions in order for um, those two partner proteins can interact each other. And this, uh, especially for the sequence, regardless we're looking at 3D structure or 2D structure, we always read the amino acid sequences from N terminus to C terminus. So it's the same order as um, the protein or polypeptide is synthesized. And there are sort of different classes, like a, a largely three different classes based on the, um, the shape of the protein structure, um, either uh, fibrous, globular, or membrane proteins. And there are a lot of subcategories on that too. For example, membrane proteins can be either like an integral protein that sort of embedded inside the um, lipid bilayer, or the um, can be just attached to the side of the lipid bilayer, which is a um, like membrane associated protein and so on. So um, let's talk a little bit more of these properties of different shaped proteins. The first one is fibrous proteins. And they're relatively simple when you look at the, um, the actual like amino acid sequences too. There are not much of complexity there. Repetition of two or three amino acids basically consecutively. And also they have a pretty simple like even um, higher level structure to making the, um, some kind of regular structure like a either linear to form the, um, some kind of bundles together, or it can be just uh, some kind of coils, or them um, can make them um, some kind of sheet structure too. And they're often used for the, um, some kind of um, structural components of the cells, like the, um, the making scaffolds of the protein, uh, not the protein, but the, um, some kind of organelle, or the, um, the cell membrane itself to you know, make it into a certain shape and want to maintain it and where the, um, these uh, structural um, uh, proteins, like fibrous proteins are a lot involved in making those structures. So an example is a collagen that you can see a lot in your, you know, under your skin, as well as all the connective tissues. And they are relatively insoluble and you can imagine that because these are pretty much like a simple structure, um, sim um, constituting simple, um, uh, amino acids. So uh, if they are having the, um, the, some nonpolar amino acids, then that's going to be insoluble to water. And if, even if the, um, the salt solution too, where the, um, the ion um, interaction is important because these are mostly kind of simple structure with the nonpolar amino acids, they're not going to have much of interaction um, between those like salts, salt ions too. The second um, category is a globular protein where it looks like a, some kind of blob basically. So it's a um, roughly spherical shape, but it doesn't have to be really spherical. It can be like a dumbbell shape or some kind of other shapes basically, but the, um, kind of having um, round and smooth like surfaces there. And that's because there are the, all the amino acids in there consists of that protein are sort of compacted compactly folded together inside. So when you look at the, um, the inside of that globular protein, they're mostly hydrophobic. Um, and it kind of makes sense, right? When you look at and think about the, um, the energy, um, the internal energy is how to stabilize this structure and so on, because try to avoid the, um, the interaction with the water molecule. So it gets inside and gets stabilized in there with the other hydrophobic um, amino acids, as opposed to that, that um, hydrophilic, um, amino acids are exposed on the outside of the uh, protein basically. So in order for it to uh, interact with the, um, the solvents, especially water molecules in biochemical um, uh, systems or environments. And because they have a lot of hydrophilic um, amino acids and hydrophilic amino acids are basically amino acids that are charged or um, polar, non-charged, but still polar, right? So um, those are, of course, will interact 
really well with the water molecule, which is polar too. So it's really uh, a lot soluble in there. And they're mostly seen in the, um, the cytoplasm and works as uh, some kind of um, protein as it is. Instead of making a higher order structure, they just uh, float around because they are soluble proteins. They're not gonna make any aggregates. They're gonna just float around and will function as they are, you know, um, sort of by itself. So um, they have typically have like enzymatic functions or some kind of other functions that have to be dynamically regulated like transcription and so on. Um, the last one here is the membrane associated proteins. And basically the protein, these proteins are either buried inside of the um, lipid bilayer, um, not necessarily just a plasma membrane, but also can be beyond any kinds of like um, membrane structure in the organelle like nuclear envelope or the, um, the ER membrane or mitochondria inner or outer membrane and so on. Um, and the, um, they naturally will have a hydrophobic amino acids exposed to the outward, outside of the protein because it has to interact with the, um, the um, not interacting, but at least have a more affinity to the, um, the nonpolar lipid um, molecules, which are the most constituents of the, um, the membranes. So, um, so they are insoluble in water, basically, aqueous solution, and will generally have uh, fewer hydrophilic amino acids than the, um, the, this, these uh, globular proteins. So now we're talk about we're going to talk about um, the different levels of a protein structure. So far, we talked about the primary structure, which is the same as basically amino acid sequence, right? And then the secondary structure is basically how it forms the, um, some kind of simple structure using those local regions of the amino acids within the, um, the small, like a uh, polypeptide. So they can make them um, some kind of loop kind of structure or the alpha helical structure, as you can see here, or the beta plated sheet or some kinds of barrels um, and so on. So those kinds of simple structures um, are called as a secondary structure of the uh, polypeptide. And when you take into account of those um, secondary structures, you typically ignore the side chains because they can just, you know, locate in the, um, any kinds of random directions. But the most important thing is the, how the backbone is arranged or um, oriented. So whether it's going to make um, this kind of coil structure for alpha helix or the um, kind of sheet structure for beta sheet or uh, plated sheet here. And the, um, on in, for this secondary structure, hydrogen bonding plays a pretty critical role because the, um, the, uh, some side chains that are exposed outside or inside of these structures has to have uh, some um, stable interaction with the other ones to keep this structure. So uh, typically it happens internally. So intramolecular interaction plays a critical role in this case. Um, the third one is a tertiary structure where you can see it here. So it's a sort of a really kind of folded the 3D structure of the polypeptide. And it can be just a one functional protein too. Um, so it is also compact and of course contains a lot of secondary structures inside of it. So this is just a hypothetical example, but you can see that you know, there's a little like loop here maybe a little bit of helical structure, not much, but the, um, you know, um, some kind of straight, like uh, uh, straightened structure here, possibly the, um, the pleated um, sheet structure too. You can see the sort of coil here, you know, of a um, helical structure there too. And the, um, also it allows the, um, this polypeptide to have the, um, the long distance amino acid interaction. So for example, one that located here and the other located here used to be far apart when you look at them just a linear amino acid sequence, but when they're folded up, then now we can you know, interact with each other. Again, can be the hydrogen bonding or some kind of interaction, to, uh, other interactions too, like um, some hydro hydrophobic effect can be involved there too, you know, depending on where you're looking at in the protein. And also um, it can be the, um, the covalent bonding like a disulfide bonding. The last one is a quaternary structure. It's, well, essentially the same as 
tertiary structure, but instead of having just a one blob, it has the multiple blobs, so multiple subunits or chains, and they actually um, interact with each other, either covalent bonding in most cases, to form the, um, the one huge complex, protein complex. Typically have um, at least the two folded polypeptide chains, which each of them form the, um, the tertiary structure. Any questions so far? Okay. And the, um, for forming the, um, this kind of even um, tertiary and coordinary structures, disulfide bond is really important. And again, disulfide bond is basically a covalent bonding that is made between two cysteines, right? the amino acid cysteines. And on the example um, that um, you're seeing here is the bovine insulin, which has the two subunits, A chain and B chain. And what you're seeing now here is the basically a, a primary structure, right? Where you can see that just a list of amino acids and that are um, on the, along the, on the polypeptide. But you know, when you look at it actually, instead of just a having a long kind of a linear structure, there's a disulfide bond involved there to um, link this cysteine here and this cysteine here in the, um, the A chain together, which is called as intra-chain disulfide bond. So it actually forms the, um, the kind of particular secondary structure there. And also the disulfide bond can link the, um, these two different subunits of bovine insulin, A chain and B chain. As you can see, there are two disulfide bonds. Again, S is for sulfur, which is coming from the, um, the site um, cysteine and can hold these two different chains together, making as a kind of you know, protein complex there. So it, in, um, involves, it, it involves the, um, the uh, coordinating structure too. So again, disulfide bonding is really important for making this kind of complicated structure of the protein. And the, um, um, the reason that we are looking at these proteins especially protein, you know, amino acid sequences, the primary structure, as well as um, higher level structures is to tell that the, um, how similar this protein is to be you know, compared to the other you know, counterparts in other uh, species. And that can give us a lot of information for just the research too, but also um, getting an idea about the evolution path or the, um, some kind of critical events during the evolution and so on. So um, we can basically compare those protein sequences. And we're talking about amino acid sequences, not the, um, the nucleotide sequences here during the evolution. Um, and the proteins that shares the, um, the common ancestor, so kind of similar enough in their primary sequences are called as homologous protein or homologs. And basically the goal of you know, comparing these protein sequences and finding the homologs or homologous proteins are to first build the phylogenetic tree. Well, um, this is one example of a phy phylogeny uh, or phy phylogenetic tree here, where you can see the, um, the um, relationship between the um, different species where the divergence happens during the path of evolution. So you can get a better idea and sort of you know, predict that the, um, what kind of those fun, uh, protein functions are, the structures are, and so on. So basically, if you already have a protein uh, with the known sequence and structure, and if you find the, um, the new protein in interest, and um, you can simply just uh, match it with the database and find the, um, the homologous sequences there from the, um, the divergence organisms to make a sort of um, you know, relationship trees there. And also you can predict the, uh, their structures and functions there. Um, and the similarity doesn't have to be too high. Sometimes you just focus on certain regions or certain domains of the protein. Sometimes you just uh, you know, scan through the, um, the whole protein too, um, depending on what you're looking at and what you wanna you know, find out. And also uh, it gives us uh, a lot of like a research point or areas where it has the uh, human relevance, like disease relevance or certain mutations or the um, certain you know, conditions where the, um, the certain protein is folded in the certain different ways and things like that. Um, this uh, graph basically shows the, um, the 
relationship between the number of amino acid changes and the, um, the divergence there. So um, the overall trend is that um, as you have divergence happens earlier, you're gonna have more changes in amino acid sequences in different species, right? But their degree is quite different here. Um, when you look at um, the, this histone H4, there's a lot of, you know, um, even if there's, uh, you go back to a really long time ago, there's not much of amino acid changes, meaning that, you know, what does that mean actually? It can mean kind of many different things, but what can it mean? Anyone? Even if you go back to the um, really long time ago, the amino acid sequence is almost the same. It's almost identical. What would that mean? Yes? I'm sorry. Yeah, they're, they share the common ancestor, but um, even these guys, the red line and green line shares the common ancestor there too. But as you can see, when you go to the, um, the some uh, little like, I don't know, hundred million years ago, there are huge differences in amino acid changes as opposed to some proteins have little to no changes there. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's the perfect answer actually. So, um, so that means, e if they have small changes, that, that can actually lead to uh, some kind of detrimental result, consequence, right? So they have to just maintain that exact sequence as it is for a long period of time. Otherwise, they're gonna mess up with their system. So that means this protein, histone H4, is really important. It's best optimized version, so you don't wanna change it at all, mess up with it at all. Um, and histone H4, as you can remember, is one of you know, histone subunits that forms the, um, the nucleosome. So that is really important, right, at the lower level uh, to regulate the, um, the pro uh, chromatin structure and so on, as opposed to some other proteins. Even if they are highly conserved, uh, for example, these fibrinopeptides are less important in terms of conserving their sequences. So as long as they're functional, that's fine. So that's one reason. And also the other thing is that you can actually see the size of the protein. If the protein size is smaller, then it has a less chance to be you know, um, uh, changed during the course of evolution, right? So um, those are the uh, uh, may, two out of many factors that can change this kind of evolution pattern. All right. So, we just uh, talked about the, um, the homologous protein, basically similar proteins within the phylogenetic tree that shares the common ancestor. But they have a subcategorization there too, to um, actually look at um, the different aspects of those homologies. So there are two subcategorization. One is the orthologous amino acid protein sequences and the other the prologous sequences. And they're also called as orthologs and paralogs that have orthology and prology. You know, those are all the same things in a, in a slightly different setup. So orthologous sequences or orthologous proteins basically are the ones that share or uh, have the um, similar amino acid sequences, but they're uh, found in the, um, the different species. So for example, you just find the, um, the really similar looking gene or protein there, but the, um, you can see that in the frog, human, or mouse too, in which case there are different species, but you're still looking at the um, really similar protein there, right? So it's called, um, they're called as orthologous protein or the orthologous sequences. And the, um, the, that basically um, happens due to the, um, the conventional divergence, which is uh, gene duplicate on uh, the uh, speciation effect where the, um, the, it shares the common ancestor, but it can be on um, the different species. But since it shares a common ancestor, they're gonna share the, um, the some feature, um, common features, common genes or the proteins there, right? So that's why it happens. And with an example of cytochrome C that we're gonna discuss um, in a minute. And the second one is the prologous sequences where it also shares the 
similar sequences because um, it's homologous sequences, but within the same species too. For example, there are different genes that are looking quite similar, like alpha chain and beta chain for the globin protein, um, but the, um, they are found in the, within the same species. So they're gonna be called as paralogs, just, just a second. Um, and the, um, the mode of evolution, the uh, drive force of making these paralogs is basically the gene duplication event during the evolution. Um, I hope you have heard of this gene duplication event. So that happened the, um, the, at least one time during the evolution where it just copies the, um, the whole genome to the, um, the next one and then just to keep all those things. And then there are different variations and uh, you know, divergence and the mutation happens during the time of evolution. So there are different, but um, their origins are the same basically. Uh, when you go back to the, um, the uh, book four, the gene duplication event. So an example is globins. Yes, question. How can you tell what? So the question is that, um, how can you tell that those two genes or proteins are orthologous or have orthology there? It only based on the sequence comparison. So nothing else. I mean, you're not God, so you don't, I mean, just suppose that um, there's God. Um, you don't know the intention. You don't know the, um, the origin of that, right? The only measure that you can tell that um, there are similar um, or share the common ancestor is to just uh, compare the, um, the current protein sequences and see that um, how much of regions are matching to the other. Sometimes it doesn't have to be the exact match if it shares the you know, similar like property of the amino acids, let's say that um, both are acidic, both are basic and things like that, then also there can be the, just a little bit of variation, but still can be considered as a similar um, sequence question. That's a good question. So there are orthologs. Could they have completely different function? Typically, they share quite similar function. So, I mean, there's a rule of thumb for bioinformatical uh, structural um, research and things like that, but sequence identity can be as low as a 30%. So 30% is not that much. I'm, I'm not gonna actually ask this during an exam, you know, so you don't need to, this is an you know, extra information. But you know, even if the sequence identity is a 30%-ish, it can still share the similar structure in you know, a higher probability. And when it shares the similar structure, interestingly, it affects the, um, the actual property or the function of the protein itself. So they tend to share the similar function too. So you can actually tell that. And of course there are homology, homologous proteins share like 60% or 70% of you know, sequence identity, in which case it's most likely share the uh, same you know, function there. Same thing applies to paralogs too. So they tend to share very similar uh, functions. Not all the cases, but most, most cases. Any other questions? All right, so uh, cytochrome C is an example for orthologs. And again, orthologs are basically the similar um, amino acid sequences between different species, right? So this cytochrome C is found in all, all organisms. And you can basically build the, um, the phylogenetic tree of this cytochrome C, and you can see the, um, the, all the different like, species here. They're grouped in the, um, the bigger categorization as like a fun, fungi, mammals, and so birds, and so on. And by looking at this phylogenetic tree, you can actually tell that um, how much of sequence identity they could have, right? Of course, the closer distance have the, uh, with the, um, the sharing the branch point um, nearby, meaning that um, they're quite similar as opposed to one that located here like penguin and um, up here, some kind of ancestor will have uh, quite a bit of difference and also penguin and um, the, here the hornworm um, moth can have the, um, the quite different kind of sequences, but still related there. 
um, and those are auto, auto logs and probably having the, um, the same function too. All right. So Globian is another example, but an example for paralog. So that means gene duplication event um, has driven this um, generation of these paralogs. And um, there are a lot of the Globin family um, members, basically, and all those Globin family are the, um, the um, essentially oxygen binding protein. So they actually share exactly the same function there. Uh, and especially the human A gene and D genes, which are encoding the, um, the alpha and delta chains of the globin were duplicated a little less than 50 um, million years ago. So relatively happening um, recently, you know, compared to the, um, the, uh, throughout the, um, the whole evolution. So A and D are relatively closer. Here you can see the alpha and delta, even if there's a distance, it's a little bit closer actually when you compare to the, um, the other globins, hemoglobin, myoglobin, and so on. And the, uh, the globins are also um, not just the paralogs, but also orthologs, because you can see the, um, the same um, chains, like alpha chain in different species, like human, mouse, chicken, and so on. Again, this is a resultant of the, um, the uh, speciation event, um, which is sort of you know sharing the common ancestor, but have a divergence to the, um, the different species. And of, of course, there are paralogs because you can see the multiple different kinds of chains there, alpha, beta, you know, um, gamma, delta, and so on. Um, and they are quite similar, but um, having the, um, the uh, even longer um, like uh, branching point there. Okay, so so far we talked about question. How does that differ? What? <laughs> the difference between orthologs and paralogs. You mean there are several paralogs, let's say A, B, C, D, and how can you tell how much difference between A and B and A and C? Is that your question? So you can basically you know, draw the phylogenetic tree for that too, not just to focus on the, um, the single gene with the different species, which is a phylogenetic tree, right? But you can draw another tree focusing on one species, but um, uh, using them um, all different paralogs there by the looking at the similarity of amino acid sequences, in which case you can you know, tell the differences or the you know, relationship between them, right? Um, if they are close enough, then that means their divergence happens pretty recently as opposed to if they're vastly different, but still within the same category of a certain family, then that means that you know, um, the gene duplication happens much, much earlier. Does that make sense? <laughs> wow. Um, I guess, I mean, that's a more like a philosophical <laughs> question. Um, why? Why the gene duplication happens? I guess that's a, um, I mean, maybe, maybe that's what it is, or the, um, uh, that, what she said meant by God, or the, um, maybe it was the um, sort of a survival strategy where the, um, they had some kind of serious kind of environmental, like severe conditions and they wanted to survive, in which case they try to you know, make a sort of you know, diversity there. And gene duplication can be one of those kinds of events. Also cells can fuse and you know, um, uh, sometimes like, uh, like divided into different cells and then kind of you know, further their specialization and things like that during the evolution. So that could be an, another driving force for that. Definitely having more diversity is a great thing. You know? And also it's costly actually, because you have to keep them during the, um, the, your life as well as reproduction too. So it's a, you know, they're trying to find the, um, the sweet spot, I think. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, so, um, in order for us to tell that um, how much 
identity or the you know, similarity um, between uh, different proteins are, we need to identify their protein sequences, right? In order to do so, we use different techniques for protein sequencing, basically identifying all the components, components I'm talking about amino acids of the polypeptide or the, um, the whole protein. It can be the protein complex too. And the two major methods that have been used for directly um, sequencing the protein amino acid um, sequences are the Admund degradation reaction and mass spectro uh, spectrometry, which is mass spec. Um, and also, um, if you know the, um, the DNA or mRNA sequences, of course, you can just match those sequences using the codon, right? The genetic codes, and can predict the, um, the, their um, amino acid sequences too. But sometimes it's hard, especially when you're working with the, some species or the model organisms that do not have the whole genome sequences that are identified or you know, annotated yet. Um, there's a limitation for that, right? So mass spec, and admin degradation reactions are widely used. So we're gonna talk about those two methods today um, as a biochemical tools. And um, before then, the all, both of the methods as well as all other um, amino acid sequence identification methods or approaches share the um, similar scheme here where the, um, the, they start with the, um, the protein in interest. And what they do is basically if they are connected by disulfide bond for making the protein complex. They want to tear them apart, basically, making everything simple, right, in structure too. So protein with the tertiary uh, coordinated structure has to be reduced to the, um, the simplest form first, which is the primary or the secondary form. So you reduce this disulfide bond, which has a critical role in making those higher level structure and then making it into the, um, sort of these kind of you know, um, threads. And then you isolate these different um, subunits separately and then make a fra fragmentation using quite a bit of different methods. Um, it can be chemical or physical too. And then identify the sequence of these little small fragments and then try to build them up again by looking at the overlapping regions. And you do the same thing for the all different um, chains or the subunits of the, your um, protein complex in interest and do that, you can do that multiple times to see that the, um, you know, there's a divergence in um, overlapping regions. And then and you're gonna end up having a good uh, uh, sequence identity for the, um, the each chains or each subunits, right? And then you actually, instead of reducing this disulfide bond, you can actually keep that and do a similar procedure where you can identify where the cysteine cysteine bonding happens to. And then uh, in the end, you're gonna have the full protein sequences there. So admin degradation basically uses the same kind of you know, um, uh, uh, workflow here, um, but it uh, uses uh, some different uh, chemicals than other methods. So we're gonna uh, discuss how this admin degradation reaction um, identifies the um, protein sequence. So what it does, uh, you can see it in this diagram, is that you know, first there's a protein, like I told you, um, reduce the, um, the disulfide bridges first, and it uses the performic acid, CH2O3 here, um, to oxidize the, um, the, all the um, cysteine, uh, what is it, disulfide bonds on the cysteine. And then separate the, um, the, all the uh, uh, components, basically, the subunits of the protein complex. And first, they determine the, um, the amino acid composition of each chain. And when I you know, say chain, that's basically a subunit of the, um, the protein complex. And then also, you determine the, um, the terminal amino acid, the identify that of each chain, and you do that. You know, over and over again, basically, to identify all the sequences. And these fragments have to be pretty small, um, small as small as like a 50 amino acid long or so. So again, make everything simple first, so you can you know, focus on those individual molecules, the, the uh, little polypeptides, and analyze it without much of an error. 
And then you separate those fragments and identify them and you do this you know, multiple times to get, basically get the, um, um, the whole sequence that is overlapping in different regions. Um, so uh, in the end, you're gonna have the overall protein structure. Question. Oh. Right, so we talked a lot about breaking the disulfide bond, right? But what about other interactions? How do you do that? Do you just keep them? What do you think? What kind of interactions are involved in forming this tertiary or even like um, uh, quaternary structure? What are they? You are much advanced now. No, I mean, yes, it is. I mean, hydrolysis is involved in breaking the amino acids and things like that. But I'm just uh, talking about the um, general, like, any kinds of energy or bondings that are involved in the, um, the making the protein structure, 3D structure. There's definitely disulfide bond. Exactly. So last time we talked about the, um, the hydrogen bonding that is involved for the, um, the side chain interactions. And also there's a stacking force for the, especially for one that have the, um, so like a phenol rings or phenol ring derivatives, right? Histidine and so on, um, the tyrosine and so on. So basically all other interactions except for this disulfide bonds are transient, non-covalent bondings. So you can just simply heat it up and just get it all break, broken down. Um, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. so, um, so the question was that, you know, what about the acid-based reactions between the um, different side chains of the amino acids within the polypeptide? Right. Is that the right question? Those are ionic interactions, more like ionic interaction, right? That one is charged positively, the other is charged negatively and things like that. Again, this is not a covalent bonding, so it can be easily broken down by heating it up. So giving them the more energy is important to break down those kinds of energies. And as you, rem um, hopefully you can remember the, um, my first or second lecture where I listed the, um, all the biologically relevant bondings or the interactions, and all of the non-covalent bondings were on the bottom where you can just simply break, break them down without much of energy input. There was another question, yes. Uh, I didn't catch the... Purifying? So purifying is basically selectively just to collect only those proteins in interest. So in the end, you're gonna have like a, all different kinds of mixtures of different amino acids and stuff like that, right? For um, sequencing too, you're gonna have a lot of different stuff. So here, where, where do I actually write it as a purify? Here. So um, you're gonna have a bunch of stuff in the cell. So we're gonna actually talk about it in a later, but you know, all different kinds of Biomacromolecules are included, like a carbohydrates and stuff like that. You want to purify only the proteins first of there, right? So um, that's why you do the purification step. It's a kind of um, quick and dirty kind of step that is happening at the beginning, but definitely I mean, followed by the, um, the other series of a purification question. How does the, what was it? I heard it as a radioactive, but. <laughs> reagents. How does the reagent? Oh, got you. So what's the mechanism actually? How does the, um, the, this particular reagent is involved for making, identifying the amino acid sequence? That's a good question because hopefully I can explain that in the, um, the coming 
two slides or so. So I'll do that. Any other questions? Yep. Good question. So why do we do this? I mean, why do we want to break this down? Because it's really hard to just read it. So it's not like the, um, just the letters on the paper where you can just read it, right? It's just a, something that you can't visualize at all. And there are local, basically, you know, um, exist as a sort of uh, some kind of blob or, you know, like random with a random orientation and so on. So what you want to do is first to see that you know, where the relative location is, right? And also to identify individual of them the best method in here, as, um, at least in the admin degradation, is to isolate the, um, the single amino acid where you can just examine that one molecule and identify that comparing with the, um, some kind of standard. You do that and the next step will be moving to the next one and basically do the same thing, right? You can't just, yeah, it's unfortunate that um, you can't really identify multiple amino acids that are linked together at, um, at the same time or the, um, at once. Um, I mean, in theory, you can, if you want to do it in the, um, the different, using the different methods, but um, at least admin degradation doesn't allow that. So, which was developed quite a long time ago. All right, so, and the, um, here, I said the, um, the important step or the, um, the determining, determining the amino acid compositions as well as basically identifying the, um, the terminal amino acids. So we are gonna talk about these two steps. First one is determining the amino acid compositions. And it's, it's pretty simple, right? As long as you can like make all these uh, uh, polypeptides singularized, so making the, all the amino acids like individually like, all un detached, then you can just collect them and somehow there's a way to you know, measure the, um, the total amount of a certain amino acids, although there are 20 different kinds. And the way to do it is to first um, get the, um, this fragment, the polypeptide in interest, and then you heat it up. It's we hit the protein um, that you have already know the, um, the total quantity there. And you can easily me measure that right using the scale or whatever. You can just uh, dry that and you know, measure the dry mass. And then you use the, um, the um, uh, chloric acid, which is a six molar, so it's really high. So it works as a hydrolyze, hydrolyzing you know, a reagent here that breaks down the, um, the old uh, um, peptide bonds here. And then it has to be um, uh, uh, set up in the, um, the pretty harsh you know, um, condi conditions where um, have to be boiled to the, um, the 100 degree C at least for more than 24 hours, in which case you're gonna you know, separate them, the old amino acids. And then you're gonna basically uh, use the chromatography to separate them, the, all those individual amino acids, pulling them down. And then you use the, uh, uh, as a following step, you use a spectroscopy um, to determine the, um, the individual amino acids, the quantity of them. And then you can use many different kinds of reagents for this spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is basically using the, um, some kind of label that can be reactive to the, um, some kind of light. And using the amount of light you can detect or estimate the um, amount of proteins that you're um, looking at basically. So um, since it's using spectro light, um, the reagents are basically forming a different colors. And, um, uh, uh, by attaching to the, um, the, those uh, specific amino acids in interest. So these are two examples of those reagents, one's an inhydrine, which makes the um, different colors when it, uh, when it, it is bound to the, um, the uh, amino acids. So it can bind to um, ev pretty much everything except for proline and it makes the, um, the yellow color, which is um, uh, blue without the, um, the binding to the, um, the amino acids. And another one is TC or the phenylisothiocyanides. Uh, and the, um, this is widely used reagents, especially for HPLC or the chromatography that we're using uh, these days. And it um, actually can be tagged with the, um, the all different kinds of like singularized these amino acids and can go through the spectroscopy to get the, um, the different 
um, measure the, um, the uh, different amounts of different amino acids, and you can tell the, the, um, the, the total composition there. And the, um, this basically uses the uh, principle of where the, um, the uh, protein amount is proportional to the, um, the absorbance of the, um, this uh, um, reagent derivatives. Okay, um, and uh, another important step is and the identification of N-terminal amino acid. So you can analyze that using the, um, the, this method here, which is a really important procedure too for the, um, the admin degradation um, reactions. So what it does is basically use the, um, the reagents, um, a lot of different reagents, but the reagents basically tags or the um, indicate where the end terminal is. And two commonly used reagents are Sanger's reagents where you can see the structure is here. It's just a derivative of the um, chlorobenzene, as you can see. And another one is a benzyl derivative like the um, benzyl chloride here. And it reacts with the, um, the end terminal of your polypeptide because it has a reactivity to the amino group. So that means it reacts with the end terminal, but also can react with the, um, the any kinds of amino acids that have side chains containing amino group, right? And those are, I mean, hopefully you remember from the, um, the last lecture, but the, um, um, some basic amino acids are the, like K, lysine, um, histidine, and arginine um, are containing the amino group. So they can be tagged also, you know, fused with the, um, this reagent too. But um, you do this multiple times to make sure that um, you're tagging the N-terminal, and there are different measures to you know, make sure this is N-terminal too. Uh, anyway, you make the, um, this kind of fused protein here with the, um, this benzyl chloride or the, um, the other reagents here looking like this. And what you do is basically add the, um, the water there to hydrolyze the protein. And hydrolysis is basically you know, breaking the molecule into two or multiple pieces by adding water molecule. So you do go through that process to break down the, um, these um, uh, peptide bonds so you can now purify only this region using this um, specific you know, uh, molecule here. And um, you can run through it uh, uh, on the, um, the chromatography basically, we, um, and using the, um, the, all the different kinds of standards there. And standards meaning that the, um, all the different kinds of amino acids with this you know, particular reagents. And you can um, compare those patterns where the chromatography actually purifies that fractions. And, can tell that the, um, um, which amino acids are tagged um, or located on the N-terminal region. Does that make sense? All right. So admin degradation reaction itself, which identifies the amino acid sequence, is using those two procedures, and that's pretty much it. And you do that in a repetition. So quickly, um, the peptide is fixed um, on the, um, the some kind of solid um, surface. It can be the glass fiber coated with the poly ring and the cationic polymer. Um, this is just one example, but it can be used on the um, other kinds of picture dish too, or the, um, some kind of slide too. And then um, you add the, um, the admin reagents, which is PC, we already talked about this, and that reacts with the um, amino acid, uh, no, am uh, amino group on the, um, the N-terminal of the polypeptide that you're testing now. And then you also add the, um, the mild basic buffer. So the reaction happens here. So here's a polypeptide, here's a PC. There's a fuse, you know, by covalent bonding here um, in the help of this anhydrous acid, like a, um, you know, fluoric acid. And it doesn't have to be this particular um, compound. It can be other things too. But it makes that, and then you drive the, um, the hydrolysis there using, again, this acid. Um, and this, this one will isomerize to the, um, the uh, P, PTH amino acids, as you can see here. And you can basically um, run this um, up the, um, the chromatography, um, you know, cr chromatographic column to identify this specific amino acid. And basically you have rest of it on your polypeptide, right? So you can just you know, repeat this process again 
and you know, um, just take out the, um, the uh, amino acid one by one from the N-terminal. As opposed to this kind of laborious process for identifying the amino acids, you can also use mass spec, mass spectrometry, which is widely used still now. There are many different you know, divergence, different versions of that, but basically uses the same principle here. Um, it, um, it is a, a, the mass spec itself is an analytical technique to measure the mass to charge ratio of ions. And proteins are not ions, right? So we have to make these proteins into ions. And to do so, we use the, um, the here ionizer here. So um, in the, um, the uh, machine called the mass spectrometer, spectrometer. And um, it has the three different components, ionizer, mass analyzer, and detector here. And what it does is that um, there is a sort of like not much of like a charged protein or the polypeptide there that was already deduced you know, uh, from the, um, the uh, protein complex. So you're talking about the small fragments here, and then you just uh, uh, spray it with the, um, the ions there. So depending on the size of the molecules, the polypeptide that you're looking at, you're gonna have a different charges there. So, and you can, you know, depending on what kind of amino acids, especially the side chains you have, you're gonna have different um, charges there, right? So you can basically um, go through this, um, uh, I mean, um, throw this through the mass analyzer and the detector to measure the, um, the mass and charge too. And you basically get the, um, the ratio of that and each particular uh, fragment of the polypeptide will have their distinctive um, ratio there. So you can uh, match it with the, um, basically your standards and can um, uh, uh, identify the, um, those amino acid competitions or the sequences in those little fragments. All right, any questions so far? Okay. So um, now we talked about the, um, the homology of sequences and in order to tell that how homologous those proteins or similar those proteins, um, we needed to identify the protein amino acid sequences. And now we know those kinds of things, then what are, what are we gonna do with that, right? Um, the important step, even for the, um, those amino acid um, sequence identification as well as uh, implication after that is a protein purification. In the end, you wanna collect or the, um, you know, um, only like generate the, um, the certain pool of proteins that shares the, like, the same protein, same species, or the, um, the, um, share the similar properties there. So you can use it for certain other purposes. Like it can be some kind of treatment. It can be some kind of you know, research um, approach and so on. So protein purification is a really important step where it is used many, many times once you're handling the proteins. So this protein purification is a series of processes intended to isolate a single type of protein from a complex mixture. It doesn't have to be a complex proteins, different types of proteins. It can be with a different um, macromolecules or even something else too. And you're just, uh, you know, um, collecting the, um, the only single type of protein. That's the goal for the protein purification. And the starting materials, especially for biochemistry is mostly of biological tissues from the, um, some kind of organ or the specimen or the microbial culture and so on, or whatever that is living and producing the proteins. And uh, uh, this protein purification is done through the, um, this three steps. First one's uh, free the protein from the matrix that confines it. So it can be the cell itself um, that is confined by the, um, the plasma membrane, or it can be the subcellular organelle too. And then you separate the protein and non-protein parts of the mixture, basically collect the, um, the, all the proteins out of that. Um, and then sort of, so that's a sort of a bulk and quick and dirty kind of a purification. After that, you're gonna separate the, um, or um, purify only the protein in interest out of all the, um, the different proteins. And um, you can use many different properties. So 
we talked about different properties of different assets so far, right? Uh, amino acids so far. So they have like charges and size and many different things. So you can basically use the same principle there where the, um, the protein have a different size, physio, um, physiochemical properties like a charges, binding affinities and so on. And you can use you know, one or multiple of these properties to separate your protein in interest. And uh, um, while you're doing protein purification, you want to also check that the, um, whether you're collecting the, um, uh, enough amount of, of the protein. And also, you want to see that the, um, the protein in interest have the, um, the pretty considerable amount during your um, process of um, cell purification that which um, is supposed to be increased. Right? So to test those things, we use different methods here. One is SDS page, it's a gel electrophoresis, basically similar to the, um, the DNA gel electrophoresis that we discussed much earlier. But now you're talking about the protein and you can just measure the rough amount of the proteins in the mixture there um, based on the, um, the size. And also you can use the um, spectroscopy or the um, um, uh, assay, the, um, the enzymatic activities of the purified portion of that to see that um, they have some desired function there, and especially for some enzymes that you're purifying. You need to see that the, um, these actually process at the substrate, right? So you have that sort of midpoint of a purification and you wanna confirm those proteins are correct, then you can add the substrate and see that the, um, if the reaction actually happens in a desired way. And also you can use Western blotting, which as you know, identify the, um, the certain proteins in interest among the pool there. Again, using just some kind of uh, electrophoresis system there. Or you can use ELISA using the, um, the antibodies here to detect the, um, the certain um, molecules or the proteins in interest, not on the gel, but on the um, like uh, slide or the petri dish. And ligand uh, or ligand binding assay uses the similar um, kind of scheme here where it also can use the antibodies or the some kind of strong specific interactions between two proteins and you can actually use that as a sort of a bait and then collect the, um, the inter uh, protein in interest. So we're gonna well talk about the, um, those methods because these are really important biochemical tools. The first one is SDS page which is a polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And polyacrylamide is basically the gel that you're using and you use electric force, electric field to migrate the proteins in interest in a different degrees and, um, and identify the one that is sitting right on the, um, the expected region on your gel. So it is also called as a denaturing, the um, protein denaturing condition electrophoresis where you use denatured proteins. So all these proteins that are used in the SDS pages don't contain the, um, the, any higher level structures anymore. So it's just, uh, you know, um, it's secondary, uh, not even secondary, primary structure there. Just uh, one thread of the polypeptide. And the reason is that the, um, if it forms the, um, the higher order structure, not higher order, but the um, higher level structure, then it'll affect the, um, the migration rate through the, um, the gel. So in order to you know, eliminate that and making everything simple and um, uh, you can, in order for you to compare the, um, the different um, polypeptides in different size, they're all gonna be denatured. And you can use the, um, the SDS, in the, uh, which is a sort of a strong detergent, um, sodium deoxyl sulfate to um, reduce that uh, protein structure into the, um, the simple form there. And these also SDS um, is coated the, um, the protein, making that protein negatively charged. So that's why you can use this um, you know, migration in the, um, the electric field that is set up on the, um, across the gel, um, polyacrylamide gel there. And this separation is, um, happens solely based on the, um, their size, because depending on their size, they're gonna have different amount of negative charges there. So it's, it's always size, just like the DNA. So it's basically using the exact the same principle there. And once you spread those proteins in the um, uh, 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 different regions in the, this 
polyacrylamide gel, then now you can use different reagents to detect them. So um, you can just stain them using Kumasi silver stain. Not only that, you can use some kind of you know, radio labeled um, uh, probes or like a fluorescent probe and so on. So there are many different um, probes or the methods that are developed till now, but the, um, in old days, you can use the Kumasi or the, um, some kind of uh, horseradish um, uh, enzymes and so on to that. Question. That is correct. So, uh, no, it's not, I'm sorry. <laughs> so just like the DNA gel, so you're loading the sample on the top like this. And now you set the, um, the charge there. So it's gonna migrate towards to the bottom of this gel. And then if you have a smaller protein, oh yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, wow, and I never actually thought about that. <laughs> I've used the Western blot for 10 years, but <laughs> I never thought about that. Um, good question. Let me just quickly think about that. I think it's the first time ever that I kind of stall <laughs> during the lecture. So it is for sure that the, um, the smaller ones migrate further. And the region Yes, it is by size. I, yeah, I think I messed up with the, um, the one thing when I was explaining it. This is a really good question that I... <laughs> um, so the thing is that the, um, here, let's go back to somewhere. No, there's nothing. But the, um, basically, they are, by the SDS, they're gonna be negatively charged, but the, they don't have any differences in charges, so total charges. So they're gonna have the, um, the similar pulling force, you know, even if they have different sizes in those polypeptides. So they're supposed to move at the same rate, but the heavier ones will have a harder time to go through the, um, those little pores of the, um, the uh, uh, acrylamide gel. So that's why um, you're having the slower migration for the uh, polypeptides with the bigger you know, um, size. Does that make sense? Good question. I just um, you know, kind of naturally thought that yeah, it's just happening. So hopefully I didn't confuse anyone here. So it's solely by the size. The smaller one moves faster across the gel. Make sense? All right. So um, another one is the ELISA, where you use also use the, um, the antibody here. Um, what you do is you have a solid support. Um, again, it can be just a, some kind of slide there too. And then you attach the, um, the antibodies there that have a specificity to the protein in interest. So you have certain regions there. Doesn't have to be the, um, the actual region of the protein. It can be the, um, the epitope tag or the, um, some other kind of tagging there that can be utilized for you know, recognizing this site. So regardless, there's a, a protein in interest and that will only have a specific and really tight interaction with this antibody will be trapped in here on the, um, the solid support and you just wash it and then use a second antibody there that again, detect and the, um, the binds to the, um, this protein in interest, but this one also contains the, um, some kind of, um, it can be enzyme or it can be other kinds of indicators. It can be just a fluorescent tag or some kind of dye or anything that can visual, let us visualize in these, um, you know, um, the proteins there on the slide. So you can basically um, see that how much of them are there. And this is quantitative, right? Because if you have more proteins, um, that are, you know, hold on to this antibody, you're gonna have a stronger signal. So, and same thing applies to the, um, the Western blood where it is relatively quantitative because if you have more proteins, you're gonna have a brighter signal or the brighter band 
particular band. Yeah. It definitely is. So the question was that you know, here, what if you just you know um, add the um, the fluorescent uh, tag here for the first antibody? Would that be wouldn't it be easier? Would that be easier? What do you think? Would it work? Anyone? Well, the problem is that um, all of the antibodies, the first antibodies will contain fluorescent tags. So meaning that um, you're basically, regardless if you have a proteins or not, you're gonna see that everywhere. So that's gonna be a problem, right? And uh, uh, there's a Bradford assay. It's uh, also um, measuring the amount of the protein, but instead of just uh, selectively looking at certain proteins, it's looking at all the proteins there. On the, so it's gonna be total amount of the protein. And what it does is you know, it is used in the, um, the, during the process of the purification to measure the total amount of protein that you're collecting basically. And it uses the, um, the color metric um, approach where the, um, the, you have a Kumasi brilliant blue as a reagent. And this reagent binds to arginine and nine hydrophobic amino acids. So that's gonna be 10 amino acids that, that it can bind, right? So that's a half of your protein. So that's quite a lot, covering a lot. And the, um, this one, once it's Kumasi is bound to the, um, these amino acids, they're gonna have different colors um, when they are unbound form, which is cationic form, here they're going to be green and red. So mix mix of green and red. So it's going to be sort of a brownish color here, as you can see. And um, the absorbed max is the um, 465 nanometer, um, as opposed to when this becomes a bound form. So it bounds to the um, the protein. Then it's going to be anionic. So um, the color changes to blue. So the maximum absorption of that, uh, the wavelength will be 595 nanometer. So it's gonna show the, um, this kind of bluish color. So based on the, um, this color differences, you can you know, um, estimate the, um, the amount of proteins in that this solution is containing. And for um, purifying the protein, first you have to break them down, right? Break the, um, the cells or any kinds of things that trapping that protein. And that procedure or process uh, um, the, uh, is called as extraction and also called as a cell homogenization. And cell homogenization is making um, everything like mix together and make them even, right? Homogenized. So, uh, and extraction is basically including that um, uh, process and also to um, purify the, um, the protein too. So um, this is basically extracting or purifying the proteins from the tissue or the cells. And there are many different methods to break, break up the, um, the cells. The most open used uh, methods are um, repeated freezing and thawing, and the sonication where you just uh, really you know, vigorously um, shake the, um, the sample to break them um, and the, um, also you can do the homogenization using the high pressure. So here's an example of the, um, the high pressure um, like machine that provides a high pressure called the uh, French press. So it pushes down and give the high pressure to you know, burst out the, um, the, all the cell um, components there. And you can also do the permeabilization using the, some kind of um, organic, organic solvents like benzene and so on. And um, basically you can choose the, um, the best method um, depending on the, um, the proteins that you're um, using or the cells that you're using. So if you're you know, using the fresco proteins, you don't wanna do too much of agitation on that, right? Where you can break the protein too. And also the uh, you know, uh, rigidity of the cells too, like whether it contains the cell wall or not, you, know, you have to choose the, um, the different methods. Um, typically the sonication, which uses a sonicator here, um, is used, you know, most often used for agitating the cells and break them out. And then you can, you know, do the following procedures like a centrifugation, where you spin down the, um, your samples for them collecting the only proteins out of other macromolecules. And in case of you're having the um, really uh, protein that is really sensitive to proteolysis, where 
you know, other enzymes are involved for breaking down the protein, then you want to use a lower temperature where those enzymatic activity is slowed down. So, yes. Um, so the question was that, you know, can we use the high salt solution to break the cell? Typically not. I mean, it's not as strong as actually physically breaking the, um, the membrane. So it's all about first breaking the membrane itself and also harmonize everything, like breaking the um, suborganelles or any kind of compartmentalization. And high salt itself doesn't do that too much, although it can aggregate some proteins. So you can use that property. And it's a really nice segue to this topic, actually. So uh, once you break down the cells, you want to purify or only collect the, um, the proteins. And you can use that by the property of uh, protein being um, aggregated. So you can use this precipitation or the um, differential solubilization property of the um, polypeptide to collect only the one that you're interested in, especially the proteins. And for the proteins, when they are in the salt solution, they tend to aggregate together because the, um, the, all the salt ions are wrap around the, um, the, these like proteins and then sort of stabilize their functions. So there's a hydrophobic effect can also be involved a little bit, but more like the, um, this uh, salt the ion interaction um, is play a key role here. So um, most widely used is the um, ammonium sulfate and there could be some other um, salt solutions that can be used here. But when you look at the, um, the changes in solubility to the, um, the salt concentration, the ammonium sulfate is the most effective, right? And there's no plateau, it just goes down really quickly. So you can basically you know, um, precipitate the, um, the protein with the relatively low salt concentration there when you use ammonium sulfate. And it's also, inexpensive. So um, we're going to um, use the, um, the, after we purify the protein, now we want to further uh, select the, um, the only protein in interest, in which case we use chromatography here. So it's um, using the, um, this kind of long column where you can put the, um, your reagents or the, um, your solution with containing the, um, your protein in interest. And you basically just uh, let it go through this column to uh, selectively just you know, um, collect or the, um, flow through the protein in interest. And there could be many other methods that can be used for that using different properties. So uh, like size exclusion, ion exchange, and affinity. And um, I'm gonna actually explain the, um, a few more slides and then we'll stop there. So, um, And there are uh, different proteins that have a different affinity. So you have to carefully choose what kind of property um, you're gonna use for that. And the, um, the, uh, again, I talked about the um, different properties. So we're gonna go over those really quickly here. The first one is a size exclusion chromatography where you use porous gels. So there are big gel beads there and they are porous. There are a lot of you know, um, pores, holes, holes there. So the, um, um, what you can do is that the, um, when you go through the, um, the, your solution with the protein there, the big particles will go through that and will not be captured by these pores inside the gel beads but the, um, the small molecules will be you know, basically stuck there and will take some time to go through that pore and pass through that. And then it you know, basically hits the, um, the another gel beads and then will take another time, right? So depending on the size of the, your proteins, you're gonna have different timing for illusion of that um, onto the, um, the bottom of this. And you're constantly putting the, um, the um, buffer there you know, to make the, um, this flow um, going constant. So the bigger molecule comes first and the smaller molecule comes later. So you can basically just, you know, um, selecting them by the, um, the uh, size of them and just, uh, you know, that depends on how much you weight um, in your illusion step. The second one is ion exchange chromatography where you use a charged resins here. So the column is filled with the charged molecules there and it can be positively charged or negatively charged. 
and ion exchange resins in the um, ion exchange chromatography will have a positive charges because what you want to collect is anions basically as opposed to cation exchange will have negative charges Make sense sometimes it's kind of confusing you know the other way around so um, what you're collecting will be your um, exchange resins basically and nothing's really complicated here you just the first use a buffer to equilibrate this process so it sort of you know it contains the weak kind of negative charges there in the buffer and then once you um, flow through the, um, the your actual sample then those sample molecules will compete with your buffer molecules that is already in there equilibrated so if uh, for the, um, the stronger the molecules with the stronger charges that can um, compete enough to bind to the um, this region charged region will stay there and once they are stuck there the other ones you know the, um, the similarly charged ones and the, um, the non-charged molecules will go through to the bottom and then you can later collect this by using the, um, the different reagents that you can release this you know, um, molecules in interest that are captured in your resin so the illusion order would be starting with the, um, the weakly charged one because strongly charged one will still capture it here and then moderately one and then strongly charged one this would be my last one for this lecture. So um, the last one uh, for the uh, methods of uh, chromatography is uh, affinity based, where um, instead of using the gel size or the charges, it uses a specific affinity between two molecules. So let's say that um, you have a certain protein, have a certain shape interface for the interaction with this, and there's another one that have the, um, the specific affinity there. And then you can use this one called as a ligand, um, put it in, included in the, um, the resin of your chromatography um, you know, column here, in which case you can selectively collect the, um, the only one um, that have the matching interface. And it is called as a lock and key, as you can imagine here, right? And since you're gonna only select this specific molecule that have affinity to your resin you're going to flow through any other random things so it's slightly different right because in here you can basically separate the um, these different um, fractions based on the um, different charges or different sizes but in here everything just flows out only you're collecting the um, only the, that matches with this lock and key scheme here so this is going to be highly specific. You typically get the, um, the single nice pick there uh, where you can collect these proteins. All right, so that's it. And I'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs>